Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, welcome. Uh, this is the VCU Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Today is Thursday, October 10th. Um, this is one of our uh, special named lectureships that we have every year. Uh, this is called the Annual Kessler Lectureship. Before I get to that, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, see, we have about 40, 45 people online and probably about 20, 22 here in person. So uh, Grand Rounds is every uh, week on Thursdays. We are here at the Molecular Medicine Research Building on the first floor um, and look forward to uh, seeing you all here. So uh, let's get started. Um, Today's the uh, Kessler Lectureship is hosted by the Division of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Immunology. Um, and the Kessler Lectureship is one of the two named lectureships in this division. Um, the annual Kessler Educational Enrichment Lecture Series was established in 2016 in honor of Lucille and Marvin Kessler to support the education of healthcare providers with a focus on chronic disease. Uh, at the back here, you will see a handout on the Kessler Lectureship. Um, and today's speaker is Dr. Christopher Richland coming from University of Rochester. Um, so to introduce Dr. Richland, let me bring up our division chair, uh, Dr. Beth Rubenstein to um, introduce him. Please uh, join, uh, help me welcome Dr. Rubenstein. Okay. All right, everybody, thank you for coming. And uh, I wanna, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Richland. We are so happy he's here in Richmond and we're looking forward to hosting you this week or two days. It'll feel like a week by the end. So Dr. Richland is a professor of medicine in the division of allergy, immunology and rheumatology at the University of Rochester Medical Center where he has been on faculty since 1991. He attended the Albany Medical College and completed his medicine and chief residencies at Mount Sinai in New York. He then completed his rheumatology fellowship in a two-year postdoc fellowship at NYU. He is fellow of the American College of Physicians and master in the American College of Rheumatology. For the past 30 years, Dr. Richland's research efforts have focused on the understanding of mechanisms underlying joint inflammation and bone damage and inflammatory arthritis. And he has employed various imaging modalities before and after targeted, or, excuse me, targeted therapies to better understand inflammatory and osteoclast pathways in both preclinical models and human disease. He has led and participated in international clinical trials investigating the safety and efficacy of therapeutic agents used in psoriatic arthritis. He has published over 250 manuscripts on the topics of psoriatic arthritis, lymphatic mechanisms of joint flare and bone remodeling. He has authored textbooks, and chapters on psoriatic arthritis and is the co-author on the up-to-date section on the topic. He serves as the associate editor for the journal Arthritis and Rheumatology, and he is a team leader for the NIAMS Accelerating Medical Partnership Autoimmune and Inflammatory Disease Program, as well as a member of the Scientific Advisory for the National Psoriasis Foundation. And somehow he's found time to come here today. We appreciate that. He'll be speaking with us on the therapeutic perspectives on immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, past, present, and future. So without further ado, I'll give you the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. It's an honor to speak at the Kessel Lecture and to, uh, to meet your dad. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I've never been to Richmond before. This is an incredible city. I got in last night around 7.30 flying out from Dulles. And what a, an amazing combination of old and new you have here. And the development of the medical center is really incredible. I think we need to copy this in uh, Rochester, uh, <laughs> Trish. Uh, the other thing I want to say is, you know, you pulled some of our best people from Rochester to come here. One of them is sitting right over here. Stephen Cates is a close friend of mine who's your head of uh, orthopedic surgery, was the first person to actually welcome me when I came to Rochester in 1991. It was Steve Cates. And of course, Drew Long, who uh, was one of our fellows, is now uh, your uh, faculty member. So uh, it's it's incredible uh, institution to draw that those fine people uh, from, from our institution. But it's a pleasure to be here. So what I want to do today is uh, switch the slide. Oh, there we go. I got it. 
Uh, I'm going to talk about immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, which I'll define for you shortly, past, present, and future. I'm old enough that I've lived through a tremendous revolution of therapy in these diseases that I've learned sitting in conferences at my institution and other places. Many people don't really understand who have been born a lot later, but it was really an incredible transition in the approach to thinking about how to treat diseases, as well as the development of therapies which have been remarkably effective. So these are my disclosures. And this is evidence-based medicine. These are some of the key papers that I'm drawing from for this talk. And so what I wanna talk about are three things. The therapeutic evolution uh, that we've seen over the last 30 years driven by the science, Barriers to remission, even though we've seen a lot of improvement in our diseases, there's still much unmet need. And I want to talk about why is that heterogeneity and complexity, and then talk about some approaches to overcome this and actually welcome heterogeneity and complexity to be able to better treat our patients individually. And then I'm going to borrow from our pulmonary literature. Uh, and this is called treatable trait strategy. And I'll explain that in a bit, but I think we are, I, I know we need to apply that uh, in rheumatology and particularly in the IMID diseases. So let's talk about the therapeutic evolution. So IMIDs, there's many definitions. This is the one I'm going to use, which is a group of diseases where the immune response is inappropriate, excessive, and is caused, signified, or accompanied by dysregulation of the body's normal cytokine milieu. Now, some people will include RA in this group. I don't, because RA is an autoimmune disease. These diseases, we don't have an autoantigen, and we don't think that B cells or immunoglobulins are directly involved, although that's not entirely clear. We have some research that suggests that they may be involved, but I'm not going to go there today. Um, so these arthritis, um, but inflammatory bowel disease is part of this group. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, uveitis, as well as hydradenitis suppurativa. And the reason I bring them in here is they also respond to similar therapies for these images. So here we have a timeline of the progression. When I started my fellowship at NYU, which was in 86, basically we had oral gold, IM gold, sulfasalazine, penicillamine. Uh, and rapid, the rapid development that changed that was in 1990 when methotrexate came on. And this was work from Mike Weinblatt and Joel Kremer, as you know, in rheumatology, which was a, really a game changer. So we were able to uh, use a medicine that we could give weekly and was effective. But then over time, as we moved through into the 90s, uh, we started to look at other kinds of approaches, such as cytokine blockade, uh, as well as uh, and the development of the anti-TNS, which I'll show you. And from there on, we developed other cytokine therapies and looking at receptors and ligands. And then the idea in 2000 that we really need to intervene early to change outcomes. Letting a patient have RA or psoriatic arthritis for five or 10 years and giving them NSAIDs or a, a mild drug is not a good way to treat these diseases because it was thought in the 80s and into the 90s that RA was a rather benign disease. This was the prevailing uh, thought, but it became clear when a lot of great literature came out explaining that outcomes were not good in rheumatoid arthritis and that the longer it lasted, the more severe were the disabilities that patients experienced. And that led to a whole change in the way we approach the disease to early intervention. Since then, as you know, we've had a no development of mother, a number of cytokine-directed therapies, and then, of course, the small molecules, which are the JAK inhibitors, have really come on the scene in the last five to seven years. So just to take you back, uh, this is something from around 89 uh, when I was in my fellowship. It was called the pyramid, uh, the pyramid of treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. You started with non and then Plaquenil, maybe Sofazalazine, and you worked your way up over time, depending on how the patient did on these earlier therapies. And as I say, it came clear that this was not the way we should be treating rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, because at that time, the mechanisms driving psoriatic arthritis or PSA were thought to be the same as RA. So everything was approached in this manner. To give you a sense, 
of how bizarre this was. This is showing you from 1994, treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, and you can see on the lower left-hand corner, hydroxychloroquine, non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, PTOT to start off with. And if that wasn't effective, you move to IM Gold, hi Steve, um, as well as um, methotrexate, which was fine, but azathioprine and cytoxin. They're treating RA with cyclophosphamide back in those days. And so uh, this just gives you an idea of how far we've come. Uh, and this is showing you if you have a really aggressive RA patient, oh, well, let's combine azathioprine and cytoxin and hydroxychloroquine, and you can see other toxic combinations there. So that was 30 years ago. So you can see how quickly over a period of time we've transitioned out of this kind of it's treat later, treat super aggressively with cytotoxic agents. This is, goes for both RA and PSA. I'm showing you RA here, but it was the same for psoriatic arthritis. Psoriasis was not a lot better. Remember the methotrexate was studied in psoriasis in the 50s uh, in California, and they used extremely high doses because they didn't really know uh, what doses to use at that time, and there was a lot of toxicity. And then when it was used to treat RA in the early 90s. They realized that doses should be much less, 15 to 25 milligrams per week. And so it was adopted by the dermatologist, obviously the rheumatologist. Um, but you can see here the other therapies mentioned there. We, see, we still use uh, retinoids as shown, but not cyclosporin or azathioprine. Um, and of course, the last one, we, we don't use at all. So just showing you that these two diseases, which are examples of IMIDs, have undergone dramatic changes in therapeutic approach. So on the, uh, the stage came the anti-TNFs. These came in the uh, late 90s, and when we saw the results from these studies, it was amazing. We had never seen results like this shown here in Crohn's disease, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and psoriasis. All these diseases had responses like we'd never seen that were really most impressive. Moreover, when we saw these kinds of responses, we had to develop new outcome measures because we have really terrible outcome measures for all of these diseases. So the next five years, moving into 2000, 2006, there were a lot of different efforts to develop outcome measures that were meaningful to both clinicians and patients. And that, and that was part of the whole revolution. So this is just showing you RA. Uh, there are multiple agents for RA now. And this, again, early, early data, but you're showing results for psor uh, psoriatic arthritis on green and psoriasis in red. Two points here. Again, we've not seen responses like this ever before. And secondly, it seemed like psoriasis patients were doing a little bit better than the arthritis. And uh, that's a theme I'm going to continue on in a little bit. The other thing that happened was there's this disease called ankylosing spondylitis, which was thought to be primarily males because the diagnosis was based on radiographs of the SI joints, which had to have grade three changes in the joints, which are very uh, advanced changes. And that's how you made the diagnosis. And those were primarily males. So then when MRI became much more common back in the mid-2000s, they started performing MRIs on, on females with inflammatory back pain. Inflammatory back pain is pain that occurs in the morning. It's associated with stiffness in the back. It tends to be in people under the age of 40. It gets better with NSAIDs and ambulation. And when they imaged women that had these symptoms, lo and behold, their MRIs were very positive in many cases. So that led to this idea that, whoa, we need to change the way we think about classifying this disease. Because when they treated the women that had these MRI findings, they, did, they responded as well as the men did with more radiographic disease. So now they developed this concept, non-radiographic axial spa, and then radiographic axial spa is the old ankylosing spondylitis. Well, this has resulted in a huge number of patients we never thought about having this disease, and it's really been a great advance in treating this uh, group of patients, primarily females, who have suffered terribly but not, but not been diagnosed. So again, change in therapy, change in approach to disease. So what I want to speak about now briefly is a major change in our thinking. So if you remember Tim Mossman from 1988, there was something called Th1 and Th2. He's smiling, Steve. Th2 T-cells. 
Th1 T cells make GAB interferon, Th2 make L4, L5, and that was all of the immunology, and we could provision it, explaining all of our diseases. But with the discovery in uh, 1993 of IL-17 and the IL-17 receptor in 1995, it became clear that there was something else going on here. But it wasn't until 2005 that interleukin-23 was discovered. And once that was discovered, it caused there to be a lot of basic science approaches to understand IL-23. And it turned out this is a signature cytokine that's driving what's called the type 3 immune response. The type 3 immune response is basically Th17 cells rather than Th1 and Th2. Th17 cells are a complicated group of cells. They're really critical for homeostasis, so they maintain the gut barrier. They maintain the mucus that's secreted in the gut and also drive all the homeostatic mechanisms, including IgA antibody production, which protects us against pathogens. But it turns out that if you have, and that's a Th17 cell, but if you bind that Th17 cell with interleukin-23, it becomes pathogenic T cell. What I mean by that, not only does it produce IL-17, but it produces TNF, GMCSF, gamma interferon, and is highly pro-inflammatory. And the diseases I'm talking about today are all driven by this mechanism. So this was a, a really important change. And within a very short period of time, we now have agents that block IL-17, block the IL-17 receptor, and block IL-23. So this is just showing you an example that pictorially, again, sort of the uh, showing you the myeloid cell, which releases IL-23, macrophages, dendritic cells, and even keratinocytes. And that, that IL-23 interacts with CD4, CD8 T cells to make them uh, have a pathogenic profile characterized by the release of the cytokines shown on the right, including TNF. And these are all critical drivers of these diseases. So that resulted in the development of therapeutics, which targeted these particular molecules and have been remarkably effective. This is just showing you the, the family of these cytokines. IL-12 is in the family, IL-17 and 23. IL-12 is more of a Th1 cytokine, gamma interferon. Uh, uh, but you can see here that uh, we've developed, and I say we, I mean the scientific and, and uh, clinical research community, have developed agents over the past 10 years that actually block these agents and have been these molecules and are very effective. So following that, and more recently has been the cytokines and receptors of the JAK-STAT pathway uh, shown here, uh, which is uh, a very complex system, but we've shown that blocking certain kinds of these particular receptors and downstream regulators can have a very important therapeutic effect. And in the case of IL-23, it's shown on the left here, the TIC2 and JAK2. But what's really interesting is that we know that there's a drug that, that blocks JAK1 only, for example, upadacitinib, Rinvoke, and that's extremely effective for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So there's a lot going on here that we haven't worked out in terms of what's downstream of these particular effectors, but this is a newer addition to our therapeutic uh, regimen, which has been very effective for many patients. And not to ignore IBD, you can see a similar kind of transition over time in terms of development of new agents. Uh, not shown here, of course, are the IL-23 blockade agents, which are now approved uh, in UC, and I believe Crohn's disease, if not, will happen shortly, and they're extremely effective. So, again, very much aligned with the therapies that we're using for the treatment of psoriasis, PSA, and uh, axial spot. So, how do, how do you put this all together? Well, this is a paper that was published by a colleague, Georg Schett out of Erlangen, Germany, and he sort of looks at, uh, in this particular uh, New England Journal of paper, he looks at an organ-based concept, which includes the idea that musculoskeletal disease includes all of those shown here, XPA, PSA, JIA, and RA, and they're all in that category. And then you have the, the GI diseases on the right uh, involving the ileum and the colon, and then, of course, the skin being psoriasis, all in this same signature cytokine-based disease with overlapping cytokines. And you can see on the right is showing you what areas are involved, the darker, the more uh, significant the involvement. But below is probably the more important uh, diagram. So he's showing you the 
tumor necrosis factor. If you look over to the left, JIA really is tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1 drives that disease. If you look at RA, it's interleukin-6, a B cell along with TNF, whereas Crohn's disease and also colitis are largely TNF and IL-23. Believe it or not, IL-17, you probably know this, actually is a real problem when you block it in Crohn's disease. And the reason being is that it has those homeostatic actions I mentioned, barrier function, uh, IgA production, uh, and maintaining the integrity of the gut. So when you block IL-17 in a person with inflammatory bowel disease, you can actually cause a flare. In some cases, you can initiate the onset of inflammatory bowel disease. So, uh, and then over the right, you have psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, which are 23, 17, and TNF. And then this is the real puzzle now in rheumatology. Axial SPA is TNF and IL-17 driven, but IL-23, no. In fact, if you block IL-23, it has no effect in patients with axial SPA. We're still trying to figure that out. So there are some interesting differences. And in terms of uveitis, the only thing that really works for uveitis other than topical steroids are anti-TNF agents. So there are some uh, important distinctions that we're still trying to understand. So we got all these great drugs. Uh, how are we doing? So our problem is complexity and heterogeneity. And these images, like some of the diseases others in this room are studying outside of rheumatology, they're complex with several components with nonlinear interactions. And they're heterogeneous. Not all components are present in all patients. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that and then show you how we're approaching this, these two elements and trying to improve outcomes. So we have this huge treatment toolbox. Yeah, and this is, this is incredible. Not only do we have uh, DMARs, but we also have biologic agents. We have all of these therapies. We have surgery for our patients who require joint replacements and other kinds of shoulder surgery, et cetera. So um, are we doing a lot better? We're certainly doing better than 1994, um, but uh, we have to really uh, look at this more carefully. So I'm going to diverge for a moment, and I'm going to issue some uh, sort of thoughts on, for primary care physicians who are listening. And uh, I'm giving this talk next week at my institution, and these are the questions they asked me. Mark Burlian asked me these questions. So. Um, what do you do as, as a primary care doctor when you're waiting for a room consultation? We all, you know, we, we're all running behind in rheumatology in terms of we're overwhelmed. So in patients that have new onset psoriatic arthritis, for example, certainly NSAIDs are important in physical therapy. In terms of agents that you can start while waiting, a methotrexate is effective in psoriatic arthritis. I would avoid it in patients that are obese or have type 2 diabetes because it is associated with increased hepatic fibrosis. Lots of papers on this, happy to expand on it if needed. Um, I would avoid, I don't think sulfasalazine is a great drug, so that's not one I would start in, in psoriatic arthritis. And none of the DMARDs work in axial spot, none of them. You, you're stuck with uh, NSAIDs temporarily and physical therapy. Uh, in terms of managing respiratory infections in patients on biologics, Generally, for viral infections, COVID, oftentimes people hold the biologic, some don't. Any kind of bacterial infection absolutely hold the biologic. Um, and for colds and uh, minor uh, kind of upper respiratory infections, we tend not to hold them. Common side effects of biologics and management. Well, if you look at the anti-TNF agents, the most common side effects infection. Uh, it occurs in about three to 6% of patients in the first year, can be any kind of infection. Interestingly, as you go out over years in an anti-TNF, the infection rates falls, probably because people had immune deficiencies we, we didn't know about were present in the early stages. You can have injection site reactions, which usually go away. Sometimes you have to stop the drug. Rare cases of SLE and demyelination, when you see those, obviously, you've got to stop the drug. So very, very uncommon. Uh, and then paradoxical psoriasis. Uh, patients on anti-TNF can develop paradoxical psoriasis. It's often the palms and soles. It uh, can be very difficult to treat. Whether you can switch to another anti-TNF depends. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. We tend to put those patients on IL-23 blocking agents because it's really effective for this particular type of psoriasis. Uh, in terms of the other side effects, I think you're probably very familiar with the JAK stat inhibitors. There are a number of papers on this in rheumatology and other fields. And certainly there's concern for infection there is concern for a slight increase in some patients in malignancy. 
um, as well as herpes zoster uh, infections, which are all problematic. We don't put our patients on a jack inhibitor until they've been vaccinated for herpes zoster now, and uh, basically occasional cases of DVT and pulmonary embolism. Um, maybe less in, for Rinvolk than it is for um, uh, the other agent, but that's other agents, but that's still being looked at. Um, serious side effects or infection. Uh, that's the big one. Obviously, lupus and demyelinating disease are also serious, but they're much less common, which you have to really monitor closely if patients are calling you with fevers and when you tell them stop their biologic, you know, get in here or go see your primary doctor. The other biggest pair we have is insurance coverage for these drugs, which range in price from sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year. When Enbrel first came out in 1998, it was eleven thousand dollars a year. It's now in a range of 60 to 80. So this is a huge problem for us. We have uh, a person in our office, that's all she deals with. Uh, the biggest problem for us is the patients that are on Medicare, as you know, because, oh yeah, drugs approved, but they have a huge copay that they can't afford. So uh, we struggle um, mightily with this particular issue. And uh, maybe at the end, people can tell me their experience here at VCU. So how are we doing? So. Here we have one of many studies which has looked at long-term persistence of second-line biologics in patients. Here's PSA. I can show you AXPA. I can show you Leso psoriasis. And showing you they failed an anti-TNF, and now they must switch to an IL-1223, an IL-17, or another TNF. And you can see here that the persistent rates out to three years are dismal. So these drugs are not lasting in patients, and this is a major problem for us. And uh, the question is, why? So this is the other part of the challenge. This is showing you outcome measures on the bottom for rheumatology. ACR70 is our deep outcome measure, meaning doing really well. The PASI90 is the outcome measure for psoriasis, doing really, really well. And you can see that we're doing really well in psoriasis, but we're not doing so great in psoriatic arthritis. Now, it's more complex. You've got other features. But how can we get around this particular dichotomy? So I'm going to turn to the pulmonary doctors over here and, um, and show you a paper that was published in, in 2011, and it looked at asthma endotypes. So what they said is that you have this disease called asthma, but they're not all the same. They're very different. So they divided it up into a number of different subphenotypes, um, and you can see them here, eosinophilic asthma, um, exacerb exacerbation-prone, exercise-induced uh, adult onset, and then all poorly steroid responsive. And they said, well, we need, in order to really understand these, we need to find out what are the endotypes, what are the biologic mechanisms that are driving each of these subphenotypes. And when we do that, then we can develop biomarkers that allow us to, I dare I say, personalize our therapy. And, and they started this a long time ago. Well, so my question has always been, well, show me proof that this can work. And that proof came out this uh, last year in New England Journal of Medicine. So this is not asthma, this is COPD. And um, what they said was, okay, there's patients with COPD. Let's see if we can find a biomarker that can show us a subgroup. And the biomarker was a very simple one. I wish we had such a simple one, Beth, but I don't think we do yet. It's eosinophilia. So they took patients uh, who had COPD and eosinophilia that weren't doing very well on uh, the usual therapy. Uh, which includes an, an inhalers and a number of other treatments you're well aware of. And they said, let's see if we treat them with an agent that blocks the eosinophil pathway, dupilumab, whether these COPD patients will do better. And I think you can see here, uh, looking at some pretty important outcome measures, that the dupilumab uh, group did a lot better uh, than those pa with COPD uh, patients who were treated with placebo. So I think this is a really sterling example of how Bearing down in an endotype can uh, lead to subphenotype identification and specific therapy. And we need to do that in our diseases. And we're working toward that, as I'll show you in a moment. So this is a slide I made up for a grant a while ago. And, and this is showing you the diversity of phenotypes in psoriatic arthritis. So peripheral arthritis, axial disease, dactylitis, which is swelling of a digit, enthesitis, which is where ligaments, tendons, and joint capsules attach to bone, uh, as well as bone and cartilage damage. And each of our patients manifests different combinations of these particular phenotypes or subphenotypes. And then I've shown you associations in terms of genetic, as well as other associations, and down below are the cell populations. The challenge is when you think about the umbrella of psoriatic arthritis, 
When you're thinking about what's happening in the skin, which has different stromal cells, different immune cells, it's not the same as what's happening in the joints, nor what's happening in the anthesis. Now, you think a disease like psoriasis is pretty simple? No, no, it's not simple. There's all of these particular subphenotypes, which we see in the clinic all the time. Plaque, gut type, palmoplantar, inverse, erythrodermic, pustular. And then, of course, there's a the paradoxical psoriasis I just mentioned. So again, individual associations, individual cell populations. So the challenge here is that we don't really account for this when we think about a disease. We use the Oslerian method of labeling a person with a disease and then thinking we're gonna to go to some, some treatment guidelines that are gonna tell us what to do. That's not the way we need to move forward in the 21st century. And the reason is that the outcome measures we use are not reflecting phenotypic heterogeneity. So distinct pathologic mechanisms may explain tissue-specific response to different therapies. So what works for the enthesitis may not work for the peripheral arthritis, may not work for the axial disease. Um, and if individual tissue environments, skin, joints, and thesis, uh, lung, they have specific signatures that we need to identify so that we can approach each patient in a distinct and complementary manner uh, that is based on biology, not symptomatology only. And then, again, this idea we can move to a more precision-based approach to PSA. I know you've been hearing about this for years in every disease, but I think we're on the precipice of making this happen, and I'm going to explain that shortly. So this is a paper we published a couple of years ago, Jose Scher at NYU, and this is showing you there's these key cytokines I've already mentioned, 17, TNF, and IL-23. These are in patients with psoriatic arthritis. In the skin, IL-23 is a dominant cytokine. In the joints, TNF. And in the anthesis, again, IL-23, IL-17. So even though this is a patient who might have all of these involvement, what's going on in the individual tissues might be very different. And that's what we need to understand and have relevant biomarkers. So what are the strategies underway to be able to address this, uh, this important gap? And they're shown here. So uncover a new pathway or cell subset or anti-inflammatory approach. Earlier intervention, can we intervene before the patient develops arthritis? For example, psoriasis comes on about eight years before the onset of psoriatic arthritis in 30% of patients with psoriasis. So can we identify those psoriasis patients who are going to get arthritis and treat them more aggressively to either delay or prevent the onset of arthritis? Uh, AI, that's all you hear about now. I got to mention it briefly, but it's still, I think, very important in this uh, journey. Uh, I'm going to talk about team care and then lastly about combination therapy and lastly lifestyle modification. So the way we're approaching this is through what's called the, you heard Beth talk about the AMP-AIM program. This is a program sponsored by the NIH. It has four teams, Sjogren's syndrome, lupus, RA, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis. And the idea is, we have, this is tissue-based analysis. So we obtain target tissue, synovium, skin, glandular tissue from Sjogren's patients, kidney tissue from lupus patients and skin, and we do, we do what's called deconstruction and reconstruction. So we undergo a careful analysis of the target tissue using some technologies I'm gonna show you in a moment, and then from that deconstruction, reconstruct the environment in the tissue to allow us to understand the key cells that are interacting with each other and also the cytokines or signaling molecules are using so we can develop new approaches based on this evidence. This is our team. This is the psoriasis psoriatic arthritis team. It's made of derms and rooms and uh, synovial biopsy people from nine centers. And so the idea is we have patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. They're very extensively deeply phenotyped. We obtain skin biopsies from psoriasis, skin and uh, joint biopsies from PSA. Uh, and then we look at microbiome, gut and skin. And uh, that's all sent down to Oklahoma where the tissues are processed. And then they're sent to the Brigham where a number of studies are carried out. Some are Rochester and some at Michigan as well. We also have patient research partners that help us do all of this. And so these are the kind of technologies we're, we're applying. And um, I want to just say, you heard about single cell RNA-seq. I'm sure it's been around for a long time where you can actually see the cells based on the kinds of genes they're producing and break down what kinds of cells are in a tissue. 
But the newest technology is spatial transcriptomics. And for that, you have your slide, let's say it's synovial tissue, and you apply probes or mRNA, and those probes will bind to specific molecules or the mRNA will cause them to be transcribed. And you can tell what each cell is. Not only that, but with, since you're in the tissue, you can tell what cells it's interacting with and what are the, what are the ligands and what are the receptors. This is amazing because it can give you detail we never began to imagine before. You can also look at epigenetics with uh, other technologies shown here, and obviously genetics with whole genome sequencing. So this is going on. We're looking at blood, target tissues, and we hope that this kind of approach will really allow us to develop those subphenotypes that I just talked about. Another approach is prevention. I just told you that 30% of psoriasis patients will develop PSA. We don't know which ones those are. We did a pilot study at Rochester. We showed that ultrasound might identify people that have uh, very subtle findings on ultrasound that can go on to develop PSA. So we designed a study, uh, Jose, myself, and Alexis, and Joe Marola, who's now at uh, Dallas. And basically, we have three arms. Patients, these are all psoriasis patients, no joint pain, and uh, they have abnormal ultrasound. And we, we established a threshold from the initial study. One group is getting IL-23 inhibition, another one placebo, and then we have a group in Canada that's getting no systemic therapy. They choose not to be on systemic therapy, and we're watching them for the development of psoriatic arthritis. And we hope by collecting uh, multiple blood samples over time, then those patients that do go on to develop PSA will be able to see what are the key factors that we can, uh, biomarkers leading to that, and also whether or not IL-23 blockade which as you know is a master cytokine, may actually have an effect on decreasing the severity or even blocking the onset of PSA. We're a year and a half into the study, 100 patients uh, we've recruited, we got another three years to go. So the other area is AI. Um, one of the problems that we have in rheumatology is that when you do a imaging, uh, MRI imaging of the spine, uh, it's really, local reading is really bad. I hate to say it all over. So a local reads, they're not really all that trained the radiologists in how to, how to look at the MRI of an SI joint. And there's been multiple problems with this across the world, actually. And so now what people are doing is you are using AI to actually analyze these films uh, and, and do it centrally. So you send in your image to some central place. This was in Germany. And then you have a reading which looks to be either equal or better to what the radiologists are doing. And this is early, these are early days. And I suspect that uh, over time, this is going to become the way we handle looking at the SI joints, both, both MRI and also plain radiographs. This is timely. Um, I, this has been my, my collection for a while, protein folding. So it used to be, it took a PhD their whole four years to develop a structure of a protein. That's how complicated it was. And now we have this uh, uh, development using AI where they're able to, in a very short period of time using AI, predict protein structure 80, 90% accuracy. And as a result of that, you can see this is, this is from a couple of years, many years ago, over 100,000 unique protein structures have been identified. And as you well know, these gentlemen just won the Nobel Prize for developing this technology. Incredibly, it's amazing what it's been able to do. Now, what's not talked about, I think is even more important, is if you look at the genes that are associated with our diseases, all of our diseases, not just rheumatology, it's not the coding regions where the abnormalities are occurring. It's what we call the dark matter. It's in the enhancers uh, and um, upstream promoter regions, which we don't really understand because we haven't mapped them very well. Using AI will allow us much more rapidly to understand those particular regulatory elements. And I think that will lead to rapid understanding of what's going on driving different phenotypes. And that's ongoing right now, so very exciting. Obviously, um, the second, uh, second person mentioned on this Nobel Prize is very concerned about the dangers of AI. I sympathize with him, but from a scientific point of view, it's all very positive. So the other, the other idea is team care. So uh, 15 years ago, we started a psoriasis center at Rochester, and myself sitting here pontificating on the left with a patient on the right. Uh, with his arm up is a dermatologist, Dr. Tausk. We have a psychiatrist uh, in the clinic. 
On the left of her is our rheumatology fellow. On the left of her is a dermatology resident. So the idea here is that we actually, the derm resident, a fellow go in and get a history, uh, and then they come back and present to both of us. And we go in and we discuss in front of the patient what's the best way to approach the psoriasis, what's the best pay way to approach the arthritis, and we come to an agreement that we explain to the patient. And this has been an incredibly successful clinic. Uh, and even though patients get charged for a room and a derm visit, we've never had a patient complain because they, you know, we, we're working together. And what happens sometimes if the rheumatologist is way over here and the derm's in an office somewhere else, they may be doing different things that they're not able to, number one, at least be on the same page with each other and then to explain to the patient. So we've been, uh, we found this to be a really successful clinic and we get patients literally from all over the world. And I brought in a number of young trainees to, um, to see this clinic and they have gone on to develop um, a whole organization called Pac-Man, which is Durham Room Clinics from around the country. Uh, these are four of them that came to Rochester and are now sort of uh, the hot stars in psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis, Jose Scher, uh, Joe Morello, who's now the chief of dermatology at Texas. He's also a room. Uh, Sumya Reddy at NYU, and of course, Alexis Ogdi. So this is spreading not only within the United States, but also internationally through a group called Grappa. So I think that this is a model that has been very effective, and I think we'll see more of it as we move forward. And then moving and closing out is a combination therapy. So just blocking one cytokine, is that gonna be effective for this very complicated disease? And the answer is uh, maybe not. So basically the, the, the GI docs asked this question. So they looked at patients who had failed traditional therapy with ulcerative colitis. And they said, it looks like a combination of IL-23 blockade with guselcomib plus golimumab IL-TNF IL IL uh, versus either one of those alone. How do these drugs operate in patients that have refractory ulcerative colitis. And uh, this is published. I'm going to make it very simple. This slide's too complicated, but to show you basically blue is a combination. Red and darker blue are individual uh, biologics. So basically for most of these measures, there's significant improvement uh, with the combination. But what really struck me that be the most impressive was if you look over on the right-hand side, you can see here, you're looking at those genes that are up in the colonic tissue and ulcerative colitis, these are the inflammatory genes, and these are the homeostatic genes, which are down in ulcerative colitis. And then you look over here to see what happened when you give them galimumab and when you gave them guselcomab, you can see that there's a decrease, pretty dramatic decrease in the genes that are pathogenic and upregulation of those that are, are not pathogenic. But look at the combination, tenfold, eight to tenfold increase in the homeostatic epithelia related genes and a, a tenfold, eight to tenfold decrease in those that are related to inflammation. So clearly they're having a dramatic effect at the tissue level. So how can we take these kinds of experiences in GI and, and put them into play in, in PSA? So we just completed the affinity study, which is for uh, patients that are psoriatic arthritis TNF failures, and they, uh, it was golimumab versus the combination the study is fully enrolled, and we're going to be hearing the data, I think, next week. So if this is positive and we have a low number of side effects, which they did in the GI study, uh, this is something that we could be looking at if we can only afford it. I don't know how they're going to do that, but that's up to, that's up to Janssen. So combinations, uh, I think, in, in the wings. And then lastly, a healthy lifestyle. We spent a lot more time on this in our clinic now than we ever did. Uh, most of our patients with psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis uh, come in with BMIs over 30. Uh, this is the common patient uh, challenge. We used to emphasize weight loss. We don't. We emphasize food choice. So are you eating processed foods? You know, are you, we, we, it might be best to lean more toward a plant-based uh, diet. What kind of exercise are you involved? We spend a lot of time on this now because we realize that we can give them all the biologics we have in our quiver, but we're going to see non-response if these issues are not addressed. Very complicated, challenging. We have dietitians we work with, uh, and, uh, and also we're working with PT and OT to get them exercising. But this is a major barrier that um, I'd love to hear about from others in the room if they're facing the same problems. And so lastly, closing out, 
you know, moving towards a treatable trait strategy, you know, trying to be more focused on subphenotypes in individual patients. So this is a, a really important paper using diabetes and, and this um, approach. And the idea here is that you use your endotypes. The endotypes in this slide are shown here, you know, which is responsiveness to a drug, poor immune regulation, uh, different immune kinds of uh, findings. And then you're seeing here the signal strength in, an, in a patient. And when what you do is you take and combine these, it's called the palette model, and you show you divide your patients not by their diagnosis, but by these different endotypes. And using principal component analysis, you can break them down in these subphenotypes, and they would likely be associated with diverse treatment approaches. And this is something I think we're headed toward. I know through AMP AIM, that's what we're working for. So what is a treatable straight strategy? So you address the complexity of any disease, I'm saying PSA, it doesn't have to be just that, with specific domain involvement, what's involved, uh, and then you uh, have validated biomarkers which are based on uh, specific mechanisms or endotypes. So in the clinic, the question we always ask when we get referred to a patient, is this really arthritis? So that's really history, exam, blood work, and imaging. Um, investigate the endotypes, so we adjust the therapy based on hopefully what we can discover in AMP-AIM um, that'll allow you to be more subphenotype oriented. Address the extra articular traits, which are huge, I've just mentioned those, obesity, diabetes, other areas, uveitis, colitis, depression, anxiety, huge in our population, and centralized pain or fibromyalgia. And then what about the treat treatable behavior and lifestyle issues shown here, which are all critical to achieving a good outcome. So it's really this combination of putting this together with individual patients that I think is going to really uh, increase the level of response, not only for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, but all of our diseases. So the future is really shown in conclusion at this slide, looking at kinome, these are protein kinase, uh, kinases, cellular therapies, disease deconstruction, reconstruction, I've shown you, regenerative medicine. We've got to redo our electronic health records so they actually can use them to make a diagnosis. Imagine that. Uh, that has to be completely reformatted. Um, but we're going to do it. Uh, informatics is going to be helpful, uh, as well as um, some in silico work, which we're doing with genes now all the time and artificial intelligence. So I think these kind of approaches will lead to uh, the kinds of responses we want to see in our patients. So, so basically, I've talked to you about the remarkable progress and the development of therapies over the last 30 years, which is five years, which has really been amazing to witness. Um, but despite this great progress, remission is rare, uh, and uh, cure in a re is not a reality yet off drug, and both patient and economic costs remain high. I think the combination of all those things that I've talked to you about has uh, led me to be very optimistic moving forward. And I think that we're in a very pivotal transitional uh, period uh, in the history of medicine. Um, this is uh, the University of Rochester, not as fancy as VCU. We got to do something about that, Trish. <laughs> um, and uh, this is the support that we have for the work we do. Um, and uh, these are the individuals in my lab that uh, work with me and also the Center for Musculoskeletal Research. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and take any questions. Thank you. Um, we'll start with questions here in the audience. Anybody want to get us started? Thanks, Chris. Uh, I learned. Surgeons to ask questions in medicine ground rounds. Yes. Okay. Um, so, Chris, uh, thanks. Uh, I learned a ton. And um, that's saying a lot. Uh, it, I, I always learn from you. Um, thank you. Uh, question for you. So we see these patients at the end of the road sometimes where they've never seen a rheumatologist. Um, they'll come in from out of the woodwork and phenotypically they, they clearly have an inflammatory arthropathy. Uh, their blood work's negative, but, you know, they've, they've got the disease. How do we sort these patients out? You know, we're doing a joint replacement or something on them or... You or Steve, I just had a patient like this three days ago came to me 70 years old, going to have shoulder surgery, uh, and she needs shoulder surgery, and she has horrible psoriatic arthritis, never been treated. Erosive, 
And so I call the orthopedic surgeon, as you know well, I say, we probably ought to cancel the surgery on Friday. Let me treat her arthritis first and see if we then see how she does. She's going to need the surgery, but let's see if we can get a handle on this. And maybe her shoulder is more inflammatory than uh, it obviously has some structural issues as well. Um, I think that, you know, you have sent me those patients at Rochester many times. I, um, and I get them from orthopedists. And so when I get an orthopedic referral, I don't know about you guys, Beth, but I see that patient right away. I say, listen, they're thinking about surgery. They, ne they need to know that they need to know what's going on. So we get them right in. And generally, they're right on. The patient has an element of inflammatory arthritis, whether it be RA, whether it be seronegative or seropositive or psoriatic arthritis. And we then work with them to address it. I think the main things you want to look for, which you know, are stiffness in the morning is a big thing. Uh, obviously, more swelling and non-bony swelling, you're going to see an OA. And then just sort of fatigue and a, a central kind of issue that's not generally seen with OA. Although certainly you can get centralized pain with OA, but those are the kinds of things. And then sending off the simple stuff, right? The biomarkers, you know well, CCP, uh, rheumatoid factor, sed rate CRP, um, are, are really can then help. And you've done that with me. We've seen your patients a number of times that you've been the first one to diagnose RA. And I think it's really important to have that orthopedic uh, rheumatology connection, you know, we have that strong and we've had it for years and it's really important. Thanks. Thank you. So I, I may have learned more than the previous questioner. I'm a pediatric hepatologist and I, I found this tremendously interesting, but I, I want to ask a question that I hope you don't find as being anything other than provocative, um, but I really learned a lot here and I think it would be fun to talk about. Not a single bit of discussions about etiology and root cause. Have we given up etiology and root cause of these diseases? And I bring this up with an IBD focus, right? There's been umpteen millions of dollars for IBD research tons of money for genetics. We all know there are 250 different IBD genes of which very few are really causative, except in the VEO IBDs. That's the kids who get IBD, which really is a bone marrow problem, which is why they get cured not by any biologics, mm -hmm. but by someone else's bone marrow. So the question I have in these disorders is, are we never going to think about root cause etiologies? Where are we with that? You caught me. I didn't talk about this, so I have very strong thoughts on it. Yeah. So, are you a GI? Yes, I'm a Okay, you're GI. Um, we didn't talk about the microbiome. Yeah. And, and I think the microbiome might be the root cause of many of our diseases, um, including psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Uh, what has eluded us with the microbiome is it's intensely difficult to study incredibly challenging. I have many colleagues share, Renuka up in uh, UCSF, who spent a lot of time and money and energy doing this. Um, there's no doubt that the programming of the TH17 cell occurs in the pyrus patches. And it's absolutely beautiful science for that. So you have in the pyrus patches, you have a TH17 cell that just sits there and monitors what's going on coming in from the gut and coming into the gut from other tissues. And it and, and expresses something called SLAM6, which means it's, it's keeping homeostasis. But when a, path, a pathogen comes in, like uh, pathobion, that, and, and triggers the IL-23 release, that cell becomes a TH17 pathologic cell and circulates from the pyrus patches back to either the joint or the skin or the lung, wherever the antigen that is being presented to it originated. There's no doubt about it. The, the biology is very clear. Vijay Kutru has written about this. Uh, and done some really elegant work. Trying to break that down in the human has proved to be immensely challenging. And so now, you know, metagenomics is the way people are going, but it's not just the, the microbiome, it's the metabolome. You know, what are they producing? And what is that doing to drive inflammatory arthritis? Secondary bile acids, short chain, bile acid, uh, short chain uh, fatty acids are protective. Um, butyrate is protective, long chain, not so. So I think one of the root causes is disturbance of the microbiome. There's other, there's other pathways, though. For example, the psoriasis. We know Kevlar phenom phenomenon can cause um, a psoriasis, can also cause deep Kevlar phenomenon, psoriatic arthritis. 
And we know that there are other actual events that occur in people's life that actually seem to trigger the disease. But I think there's a tremendous variety here uh, in terms of the key fa driving factors. But if you had to ask me in 2024, what do I think is a, a root cause? I'm gonna say it's gonna come from the gut. Does that make sense? <laughs> the other questions here? Yes. Excellent talk. I think we all learned a lot. Um, the question I have is about heterogeneity of uh, not just psoriatic arthritis, but other diseases. I have a patient with psoriatic arthritis and a few with RA in which you put them on a medicine, they do well overall, but one or two joints still keeps inflamed. And I have this one young patient with psoriatic arthritis who has done great with her psoriasis, all dactylitis, and all symptoms better. But her knees are inflamed after I changed biologics. She had two synovectomy on both knee, and she's still, so I'm stuck with her knees still being inflamed. She has been through all biologics. There are some limitations in her particular case. I couldn't do uh, jack inhibitors because she has a dairy allergy and it's part of the lot of the oral drugs. So there are some limitations, but every other biologics I have tried. So what, what should be the approach in these patients where they do well for let's say 80%, but then one or two joint, which you cannot fix. So I have a number of these patients. Uh, and what I tend to see, very much what you've just described, are these are patients that have pretty severe PSA. They've done very well on a biologic, but they have persistent knee effusions. And you have to drain them every so often, you know, which is really not good for the patient, put in steroids. And uh, I don't understand the skin type. Uh, to be honest with you. And we struggle with them. We switch their biologics around and they still have these knee effusions or other joints are doing good. They're doing well, their skin's doing well. And I had, I just saw one in clinic the other day and uh, she is is doing very well on an IL-17 inhibitor uh, in her other joints and skin, but her knees continually. And so I don't know the cause of this phenotype. We have rarely done synovectomies in those individuals. We've had to because you can't keep draining them every three months. But I think this is, again, a phenotype we need to better understand. And maybe they would respond to combination biologics. And um, obviously, that's something we'll have to sort out. But uh, that would be my, my quickest answer to you because I've tried a variety of different therapies in these patients, and I haven't seen one that's particularly effective in that setting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is where you go to the insurance company. You, you know, they don't like to approve combinations, but uh, you make make the case and then you're doing a peer to peer and oftentimes they'll, they'll go along with it. Trish. Yeah, great, great talk. Thanks so much for coming in and bringing this great science and with clinical insight, really appreciate it. And of course, remember this fondly. And um, so I have a question. I think you're ahead of us. Um, you know, we think about the other place where we, I think this heterogeneity is interstitial lung disease and patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And I think you've done a much better job in being able to sample both sites to really understand um, you know, what the drivers are, because I think this is something we struggle with. Um, and I'm hoping that you give us some kind of insights that we can then apply, because I think- Do you know this person, Augusti? The one from Europe that's doing all this is treatable trade stuff. No. His, his articles are fabulous. I mean, okay. some of the really, really great stuff. He, mm -hmm. He's, I think he's in Portugal or I think he's in Spain okay. and really thoughtful and well put together. And uh, people around the world are starting to notice this kind of approach because we've all mm -hmm. been stuck in the, os the oscillarian model, which I, mm -hmm. I, I agree with, we all do, but it's not explaining the subphenotypes. Right. And that's where we need to go in order to get better responses. Yeah, we've done like a huge amount of subphenotypes in the lung, but connecting it sometimes to the joints, yeah. I think we're still missing a few pieces. So food for thought, thank you.